Welcome to the Puberty Prof Podcast, where information and tools are shared to help you have conversations about puberty and other growing up topics. Here is your host, Lori Reichel, the Puberty Prof, a nationally recognized health educator, author of the award-winning book, Common Questions Children Ask About Puberty, and creator of the Talk Puberty app. And welcome to the Puberty Prof Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lori Reichel, the Puberty Prof. For the fall series of the Puberty Prof Podcast, I've been focusing on the National Sexuality Education Standards. Basically, these standards can be referred to by parents, other caregivers, educators, uh, administrators, anybody out there to see what's recommended to be taught in the K through 12 setting. So if you're curious about what's age and developmentally appropriate, you can refer to this document and there'll be a link for the document in today's episode. Today's episode is focusing on a topic that, I don't know how to phrase it, but some people get nervous about talking to children about it, yet it is a needed topic even before kindergarten. And that is the topic of interpersonal violence. To help talk about this topic, I invited Dr. Kelly Palfi back on the Puberty Prof podcast. She was in episode 34. And since we met in that way, it feels like she's like a soul sister. She's really passionate about providing people tools. Uh, she's written numerous books. Actually, she just came out with a couple of things that she's gonna talk to you about. <clears throat> Kelly is a counseling psychologist. And instead of me explaining more about her background, I'm gonna let her say hi to everyone, welcome her back. And so Kelly, Thanks for being here again. I'm so excited to talk with you today. Would you like to say hi to the audience? Yes, Lori, and thank you so much for having me back. I, I love the work you're doing. I'm, I'm a fan and I think it's a great honor to be here. So thank you. I appreciate you. Uh, last year when we spoke, it was for episode 34 and it dealt with some things that um, when children are inappropriately touched and we went over some grooming techniques, it was actually challenging in some ways for me to talk about it because I don't like the fact that this stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, we need to do things to make sure parents and other caregivers can help their children, help teach their children so they can even go to their parent and caregiver, um, but just base, to provide basic information. So do you mind giving a little bit of your background Kelly. Yeah, sure. Sure, Lori. And, you know, I think I think it's relevant to understand my background, too, because, you know, in a perfect world where children weren't harmed, I think, you know, maybe we can wait and maybe, yeah, I might take a different approach. But so I was part of the inception of the Integrated Child Sexual Exploitation Unit when I worked for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. So with the advent of the Internet, of course, we started to see file sharing between individuals with ill intent, pedophiles. And it, like we were inundated with files with the suspects doing this and, you know, see, we'd seize computers, we'd get like just mass amounts of contacts in their contacts book. Like you and I, if we were to look in our contact book, we got tons of people there. Well, so did the pedophiles. So it made us more aware of the prevalence of child sexual abuse. Also seizing the mass volumes of images of different children and whatnot. I just became unfortunately grossly aware of how prevalent the issue is. And I'm a huge advocate now that we have to educate our children young, not that it's a child's responsibility to protect themselves, but unfortunately in today's day and age, it is a necessity um, because offenders will work very, very, very hard to fool the caregivers, the parents of children, that they are desiring to offend against. And I'm talking, they will spend years, months, years, befriending the parents, earning their trust. I can tell you, I'm a counseling psychologist and almost every story I hear about a child who's been abused, it's always been someone very close to the family. Always, always, always. Someone that's in that trusted circle. Yeah. So for that reason, I am a huge advocate of educating kids as early as possible. 
Before we jump to the interpersonal violence section of the standards, would you mind sharing and telling us a little bit about the books that you've written? Because it does pertain to this topic. Sure, no problem. Uh, my first book that I wrote is called Men Too, Unspoken Truths About Male Sexual Abuse, and the title is a play on the Me Too um, movement. And I wrote it uh, to basically to relay my doctoral research to the public. So I researched why boys and men were not disclosing sexual abuse. Sexual abuse has, you know, only become a topic of acceptable conversation for boys and men in the last 15 years, uh, but it's still not talked about near enough. So I did uh, like a 14 person case study and talked with male victims about, you know, when their abuse began, why they didn't report it. And I can tell you one of the main reasons for a lot of these men as boys were that they wanted to protect their parents from information they thought would be too hard for them to handle because of who their offender was. So that was a, that's my first book. And there's a lot of other reasons in there about why boys and men have in their past chosen not to disclose their abuse. It's also meant to support male survivors. So if people know of a male survivor in their world, it's a great resource. Um, then I wrote myself and our colleague, Dr. Wanda Paltz, and we co-authored a series called Creating Personal Safety. And so these books are meant to help parents have those really uncomfortable, awkward conversations that we are going to talk about today. The first one called The Unsafe Neighbor is basically helping parents, like it's a storybook you can read to your children that will explain the concept that not everybody that we think is safe stays safe. So it's um, like the the graphics are pretty minor. There's, you know, the, the basically the storyline is the boy um, ends up falling in love with some puppies down the street. It's dad's colleague. They know him from work and they agree to let him start helping with the colleague who is raising purebred lab puppies. And um, eventually this man hires the little boy to help with the puppies and stuff like this and, you know, eventually gets him alone and then there's one image where they go camping and the offender has his hand inside the little boy's sleeping bag. That's as graphic as it gets. The boy's got to like look on his face of shock. Then the next, you know, pages are him going home and telling his dad and the offender getting arrested. So it, ha and, and he gets a puppy dog. So it ends good. <laughs> he gets the puppy dog that he wasn't allowed before. So it's got a happy ending. Um, it's, it's, it's not traumatizing to children. It's just telling them that, you know, teaching them, that sometimes people we think are safe don't always stay safe and you need to tell your parents. So that's the whole concept behind the, that book. The next one is called Positively Me, My Healing Journey. And it's about a little girl who was abused that needs to go to therapy and all the things she learns in therapy and she befriends the therapy dog. There's, oh, there's a dog involved in that one too. And then the third one is for older children. It's called Unfriend Her. So it's about a girl whose best friend's a year older than her older friend goes off to high school she's now lonely mom and dad agree to let her hang out with somebody that she wouldn't have normally hung out with and very quickly she gets involved with um this girl's older brother is you know in photography school and needs some models and they wind up getting pictures taken of themselves again it has a happy ending because the police get very quickly involved and mm -hmm. and the uh, pictures don't make it to the internet you know, but so it's just meant to teach children about the realities and how they could accidentally get involved in human trafficking. So, yeah, it's again there. I mean, there are some images, not nude images or anything like that. Images of these young girls wearing clothes that, you know, they're kind of fuzzy wearing clothes that they might not normally wear. But and the girls talk about being uncomfortable wearing these clothes and how the boys are threatening them in the end. So it's a very realistic um perspective of how it could happen. I will make sure that we have some links and all the book titles in today's description because they sound so needed. Mm -hmm. And like if we're teaching children, like when you, when something happens, we want them to go to a trusted adult. And that's what it sounds like in all three of those new books yeah. that you wrote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Me in the end and unfriend her she goes back to her former best friend whose dad happens to be a police officer so it yeah oh. yeah so it ends well. okay <laughs> very good very yeah. good okay yeah well thanks for sharing about your books and let's start jumping into what's written for 
the interpersonal violence area, the topic area in the National Sexuality Education Standards. I will again have a link for these standards and I'll put the approximate page of where they'll be found in today's description. But the first section we're gonna look at is the one that reads by the end of the second grade, students should be able to. So this is like, again, for schools that by the end of the second grade, this is what we're hoping educators go over with children. Mm -hmm. And Kelly, do you mind reading the first one, the first box there? Not a problem. It says define child sex abuse and identifying behaviors that will be considered child sexual abuse. Do you have any advice of how to define that? Um, you know, uh, well, I, I honestly believe that education around this topic has to start, you know, as soon as you're starting to teach your children about keeping themselves clean, I, I think start talking about, you know, only only mommy and daddy or you know the doctor whoever's in your in your family circle only us caregivers can have access to that and that you know any other adult or any other child that tries to access touching you there you know is considered abuse right that you know i mean other than a same age friend i guess but yeah i think you know i mean yeah, there's, there's so many different definitions of sexual abuse, right? Like, it depends on whether, you, like, there's contact offense, there's non-contact offenses, right? Like, forcing a child to watch pornographic videos, you know, with the intention of abusing would also be considered abuse, right? So, um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, I mean, definitely by the end of grade two, yeah, they need to know that. But I really believe parents need to be the first person to teach their children about sexual abuse, for a couple of reasons, because um, there's something called the law of first mention, which you may have heard of, which basically says that whoever tells a child about information for the first time, they take that as their gospel, they take that as the truth. So you want to be the first one teaching a child about a topic, because if, for example, a cousin with ill intent, or the, you know, your best friend's husband is the first person to talk to your child about that, they will, they will believe that to be the truth. And, and, you know, we don't know what they're teaching them. So we need to be the first person to educate them. Also, because what was that called again? Love? The what law of first mention. To hear more on this topic, listen to the full episode on your favorite podcast platform. And remember to check out the Talk Puberty app. Thanks for listening to this part of this episode and have a happy and healthy day. Thank you for listening to the Puberty Prof Podcast, where information and tools are shared to help you have conversations about puberty and other growing up topics. Did you enjoy this episode? Please like, share, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow the Puberty Prof on Twitter or Instagram. The Puberty Prof, Lori Reichel, wants to hear from you. Go to pubertyprof.com or click on the link in this episode's description. There you can find more information, as well as ask questions to be answered by the Puberty Prof in a future episode. That's pubertyprof.com. Also, remember to check out the Talk Puberty app and the book, Common Questions Children Ask About Puberty. Until next time, this is the Puberty Prof Podcast, where information and tools are shared to help you have conversations about puberty and other growing up topics.